I applaud all of you for coming on a Friday morning to, uh, to this lovely place in Bethpage. This is probably the only time you'll get into the Homeland Security office. So, uh, you know, you could tell your kids and your grandkids about it. So, you know, customer service, two words, yet have such a, a broad reach. A couple of years ago, I was uh, going to the airport to deliver a presentation in, I think, Ohio. And I was taking a, a black car to the airport. So it wasn't a limousine and it wasn't a taxi cab, but it was a kind of in between the two. And the driver was, you know, chatting with me a little bit and asking me where I was going, uh, asking me, you know, was it business or pleasure? I told him that it was a business trip. He asked what I did. I told him that I was a customer service trainer and speaker, and I was going to talk to a group of home remodelers about how to improve customer service. And he said, customer service. He said, isn't that common sense? And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, it is. I said, but it's obvious that a lot of people don't have common sense or we'd be getting better customer service experiences. So now fast forward, I get to the event. They bring me up on stage and introduce me. And I tell them the story about how in the, the car, the driver had said, customer service, isn't that just common sense? And so then I said, thank you very much, and I walked off stage. <laughs> because is there really much more to talk about when it comes to customer service other than the fact that it is common sense? I mean, it, it, it seems obvious to so many of us what is the right thing to do, how to treat people, because we have something very important in common with our customers. Does anybody know what that is? We want respect. Well, certainly that is a, um, something that we all look for, right? We as individuals look for respect. What else is it that we have in common with our customers? Yeah, we customers. That we are customers too, right? And so when you're a customer, do you have certain things that you're looking for? Excuse me, that you're looking for out of the experience, one of them being respect, right? We're looking for respect when we are a customer. What other things are important to us when we're a customer? Listening. What'd you say? Listening. Oh, sorry, that was a little customer service humor. <laughs> <laughs> I will turn up my hearing aid now, thank you. <laughs> what else are we looking for when we are a customer? Honesty. Honesty. Lies aren't good? Okay. Accuracy. Accuracy? Yeah. Okay. What else? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. I, I'm going to put that up there. Satisfaction. Fairness. Say that again? Fairness. Fairness. Okay. I'm going to come back to satisfaction a little bit later. That's why I have a question mark next to it. What else is important to you as a customer? Value. Value. Now, does value mean that you want it for free? No. 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 I mean, listen, it would be nice if we got stuff for free, but mostly we're willing to pay for products or services that we, that we are getting. What else? Personal attention. Personal attention, okay. What else do we want? A pleasant, a pleasant experience, right. Let's, let's name it pleasant, because if we just say experience, it could be a lousy one, <laughs> right? A good experience. What else? Follow-up. Follow-up, and I see a hand in the back. Service. Service, okay. And we're going to talk about what service means. What else is important to you as a customer? Efficiency. Efficiency, okay. And I saw another hand in the back. Yes. Well, you want the answer to your questions. Oh, answer my question. In other words, you should know what you're talking about. Yeah. Right oh, oh, the right answer. OK, see, it, it's not just the answer. It's the right answer to my question. So the right answer and knowledge, absolutely. What else? You want to feel like an individual, not a number. Ah, feel like an individual. <laughs> not a number. So when we call a company on the phone and we say, hi, this is Randy Bussey. I have a question about my bill. And they say, what's your account number, ma'am? 
first of all, I just gave you my name, right? So how about use it? Is anybody's name ma'am in this room? No. Sir? No. Now, if we were in the South, sir and ma'am are a term of respect, right? We talked about respect being important. However, if you call everybody ma'am, but you only call me Randy, isn't it a little more respectful to call me by my name than to call me by ma'am, which I call all the women ma'am, right? So what else? We still have a little more room. Timeliness. Timeliness. So we want you to do what you say you're going to do in the time that you are said you're going to do it. So if you say, I'm going to check on that, I'm going to get back to you by tomorrow afternoon, by tomorrow afternoon, do you always have the answer? No. But you always have the ability to call the customer back and say, I didn't forget about you, I'm still checking, and as soon as I have the information, I'll get back to you. Yes? Flexibility, not just following the rules as, as given. Flexibility. So a lot of people, a lot of organizations, flexibility, oh boy, this is being recorded, I hope I spelled it right. Don't judge me on my spelling, okay? If there's a 30-day return policy, and it's day 31, anybody ever experienced that? Returning something like a day or two after the return policy? What do they say? They say no, because this is what they say. They say it's our policy. And by the way, do you notice when people say policy, they usually spit at you? They're like, they're like really emphasizing the policy, and it's almost like they're proud of it, like it's our policy, we're not going to be doing that for you. And so I say, really? You know, so then I'll try and give them a story. Well, you know, I was out of town, and I just got back, and I, I couldn't return. And do you know Zappos? Who's familiar with Zappos? What do they do? Well, they take everything back. Somebody said shoes, right? Now, if you met the founder of Zappos, Tony Shea, and you said, Tony, hey, you know, what do you do? What do you think he would say? What do you do? I'm in the customer service business, and I happen to sell shoes and a whole bunch more things. Now, imagine if that's what your response was about your business, right? I'm in the banking industry, but really, I'm in customer service. Oh, and I happen to you know, represent a bank. Makes, makes a big difference, right? So Zappos, there's a story about Zappos that somebody called to return some shoes their mother had bought like a year ago. And the mother had since passed away. And she called and said, you know, I have these shoes. I was cleaning out my mother's house. Is it possible for me to return them? And no questions asked, didn't have to give the receipt. They took the shoes back. That would be well enough, but they went a step further. Does anybody know the story of what they did? They sent the woman flowers and a card with condolences about her mom. Now, do, is that memorable? How much did that cost Zappos to do? Thirty, fifty dollars? That story got so much mileage, certainly from me telling it so many times, um, but if you Google it, you'll find that it, it's probably gone viral. And so when companies do things like that, that go above and beyond, it just, it's, it's talk worthy, right? That's, that's what we do. We talk about these good experiences. So when we talk about this kind of experience, did you know that your customers want this kind of experience? Th does it make sense that they want this kind of experience? Why? Why do they want this? Because they want the same as we do. Because remember I said you have something in common. You're, you're a customer, they're a customer. Believe it or not, your customers, when they get dressed in the morning, they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like you do. Except I know there's a couple of you that jump in, but that's OK. And so if customers want this, and we know that customers want this, do we give this to customers all the time? No. no. We should. It's common sense. And so what happens from the time that we say, oh, yeah, of course my customers want the right answer and a good experience and accuracy. But yet we don't always provide the empathy. We're not always listening. And so what happens to us? Where's the disconnect that we don't always provide th this kind of experience to our customers? We're not focusing. We're not focusing. Okay. Complacency. 
Complacency. I've been doing this, you know, this is call number 17 of the day, right? I want to talk about focus for a second. That's a really important point. And I like to use the word present. So if I say, raise your hand if you're present. Okay. Now, most of you are raising your hand. And I know you're present because I could see you. But does that mean you're truly present? What's the difference? Focus. Yeah, right. Like I'm thinking, I'm thinking, you know, is the only thing that the people in the audience today are going to take away is, you know, I saw Randy's pantyhose, right? <laughs> because Randy had technical difficulties and, you know, that took like three minutes. Or are you thinking about, I have a meeting that I have to go to, or I have to call somebody, or I can't wait, somebody here is going on vacation later on today that I had a conversation with. And so is our mind somewhere else? Concentration. Concentration, focus, being present. And I want you to walk away from today checking yourself several times throughout the day to see, are you present? And I think you're going to find that you're not. And so if you're face to face with a customer, or you have a customer on the phone, or even a prospective customer that you're talking to, and you are not present, are you going to provide this kind of experience? Yeah. It's almost impossible. It's almost impossible. Who here is a, is a good multitasker? OK. Do you know, do you know what multitasking really is? So if we're, and, and I'm the queen of multitasking, right? I'm watching television, I'm on my iPad, and I'm talking on the phone. Who, who am I, where's my attention? It's, it's all over the place. And then I'm certainly not doing a good job of listening, right? And so if you're not present, that's going to have a negative impact. How is that going to make your customer or per prospective customer feel? Not valued. Not valued. What else? Not important. Insulted. Insulted. Unsatisfied. Unsatisfied. And all of those things are going to result in bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Because your customers are going to vote with their feet and their wallet. And they're going to take their business with them. What else are they taking with them? Their referrals, right? And so does anybody know what the lifetime value of their customer is? Does anybody know that number? How much? Yeah. Hundreds, hundreds of thousands of dollars, one customer. Let's say the lifetime value of your customer. Well, let's, let's back it up a minute. Does, does anybody else know the lifetime value of their customer? Well, it's infinite, but, but have you ever really done the math? to see what the lifetime value of a customer is. It's really a subjective statement because some customers are larger, smaller, some are more vocal and will refer more business to you, and some won't. So okay. it's very subjective across yeah. many industries and platforms. Okay, but so if we had to put a dollar amount on it, it could be in the hundreds of thousand dollars, but let's say that um, I owned a pizzeria, and every week, every week you came to my pizzeria and you bought a pie and some garlic knots and a bottle of soda. 20 bucks, right? One day, I say something that annoys you, and you say, you know what? I'm not coming there anymore. If you were a regular customer, $20 a week times 50 weeks, because when you're on vacation, you're not getting the pizza, $1,000 a year that you are my customer. And maybe you live in the neighborhood for five years, so $5,000. And during that five years, you have your daughter's graduation from high school, and you're bringing some pizza into work. So maybe we'll add another $1,000. So I'm worth $6,000 to you. But in your head, when we have an altercation and you, know, you annoy me, and I say, you know what, I'm not coming back, Joe. You're thinking, ah, $20, who cares? Except you're not doing the math to realize that I'm really worth potentially five or $6,000. Now that is only my business, but I have friends, and I have a big mouth, and I'm going to tell a lot of people, or well, they're going to say, wow, this pizza is great, and I'm going to go, you know, Joe's Pizza, around the corner. But I'm not going to be telling that after I have a bad experience. 
Who's a business owner in the room? Raise your hand if you're a business owner. Keep your hand up if you have employees. Okay. So let's talk for a minute about if you're a business owner. When you're the business owner and you're taking the care of the customer, what kind of experience are you going to provide to the customer? The best you can. Why? Because you want them to come back. Why else? Relationship, referrals, right? Why else? They're your bottom line. They are your bottom line. Because at the end of the day, after you pay all of your expenses and your employees, you hope that there's like two nickels that you could rub together and put in your pocket. So we, as owners of the business, have a vested interest in whether or not the customer becomes a customer initially and stays a customer ultimately. Is that, is that a safe statement? Have you yourself ever done business with a company and been taken care of by the owner? What's that like? It's awesome. It, it's awesome. You walk in and they greet you by name, right? If you ask, they'll, they'll come early. They'll stay late. They'll go above and beyond to make sure that you are happy. Now, that's called thinking and acting like an owner of the business. Yes? That's actually a technical term that I just coined. Thinking and acting like an owner of the business. Now, do your employees, if you have them, think and act like an owner of the business? I'm seeing a head shake and no. Yes, they do. Majority of them do. What does it depend on? Okay. Okay, so let's go there for a second. The fish stinks from the head down. It doesn't have to stink, but if it stinks, it's, it's stinking up top. And so if the owner is not a great role model, if the owner is not treating the employees well, is there a good chance that the employees are not going to be thinking and acting like an owner of the business? Yes. And so do we have to give our employees shares of stock in our company in order to get them thinking and acting like owners of the business? What do we have to do as leaders of the business? Set the example and do it first, right? Roll up your sleeves and stuff the envelopes and answer the calls and carry the things you know, from the warehouse. What else do we have to do as leaders? Training, right. How many of you provide customer service training to your employees? So the rest of you assume that everybody else has common sense, right? Yes. You have to treat your employees that way. You have to treat your employees like you want to treat your customers. Or well, why would they treat their customers that way? So if we treat our employees like this and are empathetic and give them personal attention and we have confidence and we smile at them, they will in turn deliver that kind of experience to their customers. Okay, interesting. You know, I was, at, I was at a client yesterday meeting with some employees and I was asking a little bit about the culture of the organization. And one of the employees said that he feels valued and feels respected. And he had an incident earlier in the week where his plane got delayed and he couldn't come into work because his flight got canceled actually. And he said that he felt of course, bad that he couldn't go to work, but he also knew that his company was going to be understanding. And having that, that feeling of, you know, they have my back and they're going to treat me a certain way was very comforting to that employee. Now, how do you think that translates? What, is, what effect does that have on the employee when that employee is taking care of customers? 
Are they, are they making the customer feel important? Of course they are. Are they being a little flexible and lenient because that's what they're accustomed to? Yes. And so we as leaders of the organization, whether we're an owner, a manager, a supervisor, we have an, uh, an obligation, if you will, to be the role model that we want our employees to follow suit and act a certain way. Does that always happen though? No. So a recent study by the Gallup organization showed that 70% of employees are disengaged. 70%. So if you have 10 employees, seven of them are checked out in some way, shape, or form. And 70% of them are probably touching your customers. Does anybody need to leave now? Because you gotta get back to your office because the person who's there right now might not be handling the customer in this manner that we want them to? Is that possible? Yeah. So I wanna introduce you to a couple of friends of mine. And actually, you probably know them. Anybody recognize this young lady? What's with the laughing? Is she dressed funny? I, she dresses, she's, you know, she looks pretty good. You know, one day I brought her out on stage and I said, do you know who this is? Who does this remind you of? And I happen to be wearing a pink jacket and a black skirt. And they're like, it's you. I'm like, no, no, no. It's actually your employee. This company, I'm sorry, this employee works for your company. Yes? Raise your hand if this employee works for your company. Unfortunately, only a couple of you, only a couple of you, interesting. What is it like when this employee is taking care of your customers? She can't be bothered. She can't be bothered. What else? It's an unpleasant experience for your customer. It's an unpleasant experience for your customer. She's damaging the brand. She has a negative attitude. By the way, she is your brand. She owns your brand. So you could have all this great marketing. Oh, we're so great. We do this, we do that. But yet she's your brand. As long as she is interacting with customers. By the way, speaking of your brand, I want to share something with you. I had um, seen the list of people who registered and I saw what companies you worked for. And so I did a little research on some of your companies and I went on your company website. And this is the brand that you are. We believe our job is not simply to provide products but to offer our clients value, consistency, guaranteed satisfaction and the most courteous, honest, friendly service possible. Our objective is to deliver a level of performance that exceeds your expectations. Is that what she's thinking? What is she thinking? Is it, five is it five o'clock yet? If I have to talk to one more customer, if my phone rings one more time, right? Do, does that resonate with anybody? Is that anybody's company? <coughs> no? Would you even know if I just read that and it was your company's? mission or value statement. Here's another one. Building long-lasting relationships is the heart of everything we do. We make communication our top priority. We make our clients the center of everything we do. We believe that by offering empathy and expertise to our customers, giving back as partners in our communities, and valuing the know-how of our employees, we will all succeed together. This is what we're saying. This is who we are. We're putting a stake in the ground and we're, we're, we're putting our, 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 our what? Our words that we live by out for the public to see. But if she is anywhere near the customer, we may not be delivering that. Is that a fair statement? What is it like to work with this person Horrible. Why? It's contagious. 
You know, some people come to work when they have like a sore throat and we say, oh, stay away from me, you got germs. Oh, stay away from me, you got germs. Because this is contagious also, isn't it? Do we become a product of our environment? Positive or negative. So if you're sitting next to somebody who as soon as they walk in, they like throw their stuff on their desk and they're just like, oh my God, I had the worst ride ever. Or I don't feel good. Or my kids. Or my boss. Or I hate this place. Any or all of those things are going to infect the other people. Yes? Who hired these people? Oh, this is when we go, oh, I did, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't mean to. Some people just interview really well. But, you know, somebody mentioned complacency. Like, we get complacent. You know, when you first start a job, are you on your best behavior? You're dressed nice. You say the right things. I want to please everybody. I want that pat on the back. Good job. You know, we really like what you're doing. And then fast forward three years, and this is just like, oh, you know, another day in the, in the salt mines, and I'm going to take 40 calls, and those customers are so annoying. And so could you see how easy it is to, to get like this? So when we first spot this happening, what do we do? Ask him what's wrong. Ask him what's wrong. Hey, is everything OK? What, what can I do for you? That's what we should do. Do we do that? We promote them. <laughs> or we move them from department to department, right? Like, you know, I can't deal with this guy. Here, you take him. That's good. That, that, that's good. It's not my problem. No backsies, right? <laughs> don't, don't give him back, because once you get him, he's yours. And so, you know, think about some of the people that you've had working for you or work for you now, how maybe their time has come. If we have people like this working in our organization and we allow them to continue working there, we have nobody to blame for ourselves. You know, there's a word that I like to use called accountability. And as leaders of an organization, it is up to us to hold people accountable. Yes? But yet, do we? Sometimes. Depends. What if it's the top salesperson? Do we hold that person accountable? Or do they have like different standards? Yeah, what if it's a family member? Forget that. All bets are off. Bets are off. Yeah. Exactly. I can, I can actually be you know, a liability. They can be. They can wreak havoc and get away with it. And here's the funny thing. If you're a relative of the owner, technically you are the owner or an owner. And you should be thinking and acting like an owner of the business. And you would think that they would be the good role model. And yet sometimes those people are the, the thorns in our side and are the downfall of companies because we tolerate certain behavior, right? Now, this is not the only person that works in our company, right? Thank goodness. Otherwise, we'd be doomed. Who's that? Rave. It's Rave. And by the way, don't ask me for a phone number. She's not available, OK? Because inevitably, every time I introduce her, some young guy in the back is like, oh, can I have her phone number? She's not real. <laughs> <laughs> this is the latest version of blow up dolls. What can I say? What is it like when she is taking care of you? It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I'm going to get this because she cares. She's interested. Right? She's going above and beyond. She's empathetic. Is her behavior contagious? It could be. It could be. How many rants are too many? One. One. Has anybody had a rant and let the rant go? Yes? Because we couldn't allow them to continue to be there. And so, Let's just say you've got some rave employees and they're thinking like owners of the business, they're committed, they're engaged, they're going above and beyond to take care of the customers. And you've got just one rant, just, just one, and you see that rant not carrying their weight. 
coming in late, not doing what they're supposed to do, looking like they're busy, but they're really not busy, and there are no repercussions. Nothing is happening. What does she start thinking? She says, I must be crazy. Why am I bothering acting like an owner, doing everything the way I should be, when she is just skirting by and nothing is happening to her? And then she turned into she. And by the way, she, these two she's, are women for illustrative purposes only. Make no doubt that you have male raves and male rants as well, yes? Now, there's another phenomenon about rant and rave. Sometimes rant and rave run the company. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because if you're the kind of boss that says, how many times do I have to tell you don't stack the boxes like this? Or if you get a phone call in your office and somebody says, oh, you know, hey, Mike, uh, Mrs. Smith is on the phone. What does that pain in the ass want now? If that's what you're saying about your customers, this is who you're being. And if, you're, if your employees, who, by the way, are your customers, are watching what you're doing, listening to what you're saying, there's a really good chance that your employees are going to follow suit. But the opposite, of course, is when you are the kind of boss or manager or leader who delivers this kind of experience, who realizes that their employees are their most important asset, you can almost guarantee that the employees are going to follow suit and become raves themselves. Has anybody ever quit your company? Quit your company. I'm quitting. I'm out of here. Do you know that most people don't quit companies? Do you know what they quit? Bosses and managers enter rant, right? So, you know, this might be the part of the presentation where I hold up a mirror so that you managers could take a look at yourself and see, gee, you know, how am I being? Am I providing this kind of experience to my employees, right? So rant and rave, we've now named the elephant in the room, right? Because you might have had an employee that you were like, oh, you know, I just don't want her getting on the phone with my best customer. Or we try and keep them away when people come into the office, right? But now that we've named the elephant in the room, because here's the thing, if you're thinking, you know what, I've got three employees like this, you are actually late to the party. Because who knew that you had three people like this already? Customers. Customers and coworkers. And so when we finally let this person go, what does she say? Thank God it's about time. What took you so long? So how is it that they could see the writing on the wall so much sooner than we as leaders of the organization can? We're distracted. We're not present. We're trying to juggle so many things. Those people, a lot of them are brands are very, very skilled at not showing up to the owners or their boss. So that's another reason why ownership doesn't see it as quickly, because they hide it. Or it's so subtle that you can't really put your finger on exactly what they're doing. Mm. So I'm hearing like they're two-faced, right? <laughs> oh, yes, boss, I'll do anything you want. Oh, thank God he's gone. Let's fool around, right? But somebody knows, and you kind of got that, you got that inkling. So if we want our customers to have good experiences with our company, number one, we've got to be the right role model and demonstrate the behaviors that we want our employees to demonstrate. And number two, we have to ensure that they know what good customer service looks like. And so this exercise that we did a little while ago, could you imagine doing this with your employees? What effect would it have if you went through this with your staff and literally painted a picture of what a great customer service experience looks like? 
they know this. They know this because they're customers also. But yet, what happens is we walk in the door in the morning of our company, and we take our customer hat off, and we put on our company hat. Yes? And then we start quoting P words. Well, it's our policy, right? And we forget what it's like to be a customer. Or something happened to us on the way to work, so we're not in such a great mood. And so I'm going to let that come out on my customer. Or sometimes the customer's calling, and they're in a bad way, and they're yelling about something. And now that's going to turn me into rant. And now the next five customers that I get are going to also get the wrath of rant. Right? So we as leaders have to eliminate some of the roadblocks that get in the way of our employees doing the job. When's the last time any of you called your company and acted as if you were a prospective customer? Has anybody done that? One person, two people. Do you know what you could find out if you call your company? Now, some of you may not have called because you're afraid of what you're going to hear. And I'm serious, especially if you're not there, right? Because they act one way when you're there, but then when you're not there, they act a certain way. Because your employees are not always present. Your employees, first of all, are not sitting there twiddling their thumbs doing nothing. They're, they're doing something. They could be sending an email. They could be talking to a coworker. They could be figuring out a report. And so when that phone rings or somebody walks into the office, they're being interrupted. And so it sounds like this. Workforce Development Group, this is Randy. As opposed to, good morning, Workforce Development Group, this is Randy, how can I help you, right? I kind of put my all into it, I was present. And so imagine if every time the phone rings in your company, before you or any of your employees answer the phone, you put on a cape. Da, 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 da. Super customer service representative Randy here to save the day and solve your problems. Now, you're laughing and silly, haha. -ha. You don't really have to put a cape on. Although one of my clients, when I said that, scribbled furiously, order capes for my employees. Okay? Because even if it's just a joke, that symbol of putting on the cape and wanting to help others trumps everything else. So my bad day, my nasty coworker, my crappy boss, all of that I forget about because I'm here to save the day. I don't know about you, but I like helping people. It makes me feel really good to help people. Yes? Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. What could I do to make your life easier? How could I help you? How could I solve your problems? So the giver always gets more. But if we think, oh, I'm going to work today, oh, I'm doing the same thing, oh, this is so boring, you know what? It's going to be. But if you say, you know what, today I'm going to touch 40 people, and when they are done with me, not only am I going to answer all their questions and provide them the knowledge, and they're going to walk away happy, but I'm going to feel really good because I did it. Is that a dream for some of you, to have employees that are that engaged and committed that it's not work? You know what? Then I must be dreaming. Because to think that I get to stand up here and talk about something that I'm really passionate about and help you maybe walk away with a thing or two that's going to be different so that I, who by the way represent every customer you will ever have, so that I am happy, so that I feel good, so that I walk away from the interaction that I have with your company, not only saying, wow, you know what? I never had such a good experience with a bank, or I never had such a great experience with my insurance company, but that was better than an experience that I had when I called Zappos on the phone, or when I went to Disney, or when I stayed at the Ritz-Carlton. Because your customers are not just judging you, against your competitors in your industry. They're judging the experiences that they have with you with every experience that they ever had. Now, what happens when you go to Disney? Do you have a good experience? Of course you do. Do you ever hear the employees at Disney, when you go up to them and ask them a question, do they ever say, yeah, it's not my job? No, and if they do, what happens? Bye-bye, bye-bye. Do you know at the Ritz-Carlton, 
that if you're within, I think, 10 feet of a guest, you say hello. And if the guest says, hi, could you tell me where the business center is? You know what the employee does? They take you there. They don't say, yeah, it's down the hall, make a left, and it's the third door on the right. That's the easy way to do it. That's not taking ownership. Now, are the employees at the Ritz-Carlton getting paid any more money than your employees are getting paid? <coughs> probably not. And actually, your employees are probably getting paid more than the employees at the Ritz-Carlton. So what makes the Ritz-Carlton different from your company? That management. management, training, pride. pride. This is my company. These are my customers. And you know, you might be thinking, well, you know, the employees are not as invested because, you know, it's not their company. They're not going to, you know, benefit monetarily the way I would. But I say your employees should be as invested as you are because their future employment with your organization is predicated upon how well you serve customers. And so if you have 5,000 customers today and you lose half of them tomorrow, do you need all of the employees that you have today? No. And so if your employees can understand the connection between how we serve, who we show up as every day, do you think they might have a better experience? with their customers? For sure. But how many of us are actually having this conversation with them? Right? I asked earlier, who invests or provides customer service training to their staff? And I think two or three of you raised your hand. Now, customer service training is not typically a line item on anybody's budget, right? But just like you would pay to service your equipment, Imagine if you paid to enhance the skills of your employees. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do on your own that start with you and how you are acting, right? Check yourself at the door. By the way, who wakes up in the morning and says, let me see how many customers I can turn off today? <laughs> What's so funny? No? Yet. If we're not providing this kind of experience consistently to our customers, is there a good chance that we're making that decision, consciously or subconsciously? Has anybody in this room ever experienced or demonstrated rant-like behavior? Everybody's hand should be going up, including mine, right? I can talk a good talk, but trust me, I can be a rant, right? Just ask any of my former employees. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> we don't just make that decision first thing in the morning. We make that decision when we wake up. Anybody ever stub their toe in the morning? What kind of day are you going to have? It's going to be pretty lousy, right? We make that decision. What happens if you're speeding to work because you're late and you get a speeding ticket? Is that going to set you off for the rest of the day? What happens if you've got a, a sick child or a sick parent? or your house is in foreclosure, or you just lost your biggest client, or you had a fight with your spouse. Could any of that distract you and take you into another dimension? The forbidden zone? Yeah. And so remember we said earlier about focus and about being present. If we are present, and right now I am so present, I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm not thinking about all the tape that I have on me. I'm not thinking about the fact that my feet hurt. I'm not thinking about the fact that I got another meeting I have to go to later. I am here with you. And there's nothing else in my world except all of you. Because you are my customers and my clients. And I want to give you the best experience possible. I made that decision when I woke up this morning. I got tested a couple of times. When the breakfast didn't come and all of you were milling around like, where's the coffee? I was like, oh my god, oh my god, and I could have gone here. When I found out that you couldn't hear me, that was another thing that could have made me go. When my mic dropped, that could have made me happen, you know, that happened also. But I can't let that shake me because I'm on a mission. 
and my mission is to delight you so that when you walk out of here, you're like, wow, you know, I just saw Randy Bussey and, you know, she was pretty awesome. Not, wow, Randy Bussey, yeah, stay away, not good. <laughs> Does anybody have one of these? Anybody have one of these? You know what this is? What is this? Can you see? Smartphone. Smartphone. What else? Distraction. Distraction. Distraction, without a doubt. Worst day of my life, I got this, yes. <laughs> what else is this? My everything, a tool. Productivity. Productivity. Productivity, sure. The question is, you had a megaphone. A megaphone and a weapon. <laughs> a weapon. I could throw it at you and I might hit you and hurt you. Why is this a weapon? Social media. Social media is word of mouth on steroids, right? Some of us are old enough to remember the commercial, the hair uh, shampoo commercial. I tell two friends who tell two friends who tell two friends. Yeah, no, 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 no. As soon as the words come out of my mouth, the whole room knows. And as soon as I post it on my Facebook page, all of my friends know. And when they like it, then their friends know. You shared with me, Christina, tell me about what you do when you have a bad experience with a company? I go right to their Facebook page. I have to return to them maternity clothes to a website that's overseas, and nobody, there's no phone number. Customer service was non existent. So I just went on their Facebook and explained my situation. And within moments, I, it got resolved because I went to social media. Whereas I think if I didn't do that, I would still have the clothes in my house, not back to the company. Now, isn't it interesting that a company doesn't have a phone number on their website? Has anybody ever encountered that? Seriously? Are there any web designers in the room? Because you need to be putting phone numbers on websites. But some companies intentionally don't put their phone number on the website because they don't want to talk to customers. I'll take your money, but I don't want to talk to you afterwards. And so customer service is not just before the sale and during the sale, it's after the sale. And it's sometimes two years after the sale, right? And so you were fortunate that you got the response back. Do you know that the major brands who are all on Facebook, you know, follow us on Facebook and we're on Twitter, about 70% of them don't respond to posts that customers like you make. So the customers are screaming, help me, help me, I have a problem. And they're going, la, 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 la. And they're oblivious. You don't have to be a big company to have a Facebook page, to have a Twitter page, and to monitor it. Because your customers are telling stories based on the experiences that they are having. And if you don't want to read about it on the front page of the newspaper, or on Facebook, or it to go viral, you have got to make sure that the people that you have taking care of your employees, including yourself, are on the blue side of the spectrum. Because rant hurts your business. Here's the thing. I personally don't feel that I am teaching you anything. You know what I feel like I'm doing? I feel like I'm reminding you of what you know. There is no new way of taking care of customers. You know, customer service 2.0. It's really the common sense that we talked about earlier. And so why is it so hard to get this kind of experience? I'm saying wake up. Why did you all come here today? Free breakfast. <laughs> I get it. Sorry it wasn't Starbucks. Maybe next time it will be because it definitely won't be Panera. <laughs> right? Will you think twice about catering from Panera? Yeah, forgive them. You forgive them? <clears throat> Why? This was the third strike. No, we gave them a second chance. You want us to give them a fourth chance. 
There's other places that we could get coffee. We could go to a diner. We could go to a, a deli. We could go to Starbucks. We could go to Dunkin' Donuts. Panera has competition. Did anybody talk to Panera? Did we talk to Panera? The first time? Because, I mean, you know, customer service is what it's about. It's about making things right. And if they can make things right, and a lot of times companies like Panera, which I think is doing a good job, a lot of times they will, uh, they'll meet that expectation. And so what you're describing is... But if you don't talk to them. If you don't talk to them, they don't know anything's wrong, and they can't do anything about it. Who likes getting complaints from customers? Four of you. Six of you. Constructive ones. Oh, constructive. Who's, who decides if it's constructive or not? Every single one is. Yeah, absolutely. The worst ones are the best. A complaint is a four-letter word, and not the one your mother said not to use. A gift. It's a gift, because what the customer is saying, listen, Something's not right. Could you make it better so we could go back to our relationship? Because I don't want to have to go find a new widget maker or a new insurance company or a new plumber. I want to do business with you. I vetted you out. I like you. I want to continue doing business with you, but something's not right. But yet, I call your company on the phone and I say, I want to speak to the owner or I want to speak to a supervisor. And this is what I hear in the background. Tell them I'm not here. We hide from complaints. Am I lying? No. You, so wh why are we running away from constructive feedback that could potentially help us delight a customer? So, yes. Because at the moment it's aggravating. It's aggravating. <clears throat> but if we thought, hey, this customer needs us. And here's a problem. This is the great time to put on that cape. Da, 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 super customer service representative here to save the day and solve the problem. What can I do for you? Imagine if that was our mindset instead of, oh God, here we go again. What do they want? Because the alternative, if the customer does not come to you and say, help, help, something's not right, please fix it. Even if they're saying, help, help, something's not right. Because sometimes that's the way they come, right? If they don't do that, they leave, and they don't tell us. And meanwhile, we're doing the same thing to four other customers. And so wouldn't we want to know about it in advance or as soon after it happens so that we don't go and repeat the same thing over and over again? When you get a real gift from somebody, if I gave you that pen, or you gave me the pen, give me the pen, please. Thank you so much. We say thank you when we get a gift. And so a complaint is a gift. Thank you for letting me know. I'm so sorry that you had the problem. Here's what I'm going to do to fix it. But what happens is when we get complaints, we put our problem solving hat on very quickly. And we say, oh, let me check on, let me, let me find out where that delivery is. And we miss the opportunity to acknowledge the customer and the fact that they're upset, right? We talked about empathy and understanding and compassion. And those mean a lot to us as customers. If you were waiting for a delivery and they were supposed to be there between 9 and 12, and it's 1 o'clock, can they turn back the hands of time and make it 11? No. Can they apologize and say, I'm so sorry that that happened, you're the next delivery? Or could I even do one better at, at 11 o'clock, say, I just want to let you know that my driver is a little late? and he's going to be there closer to one, is that okay? Or would you like us to reschedule? Because most people take off from work to wait for deliveries or wait for the electrician to come to their house. But are we being proactive? And are we reaching out to our customers to keep them informed? I don't know if we use the word communication up here, but certainly listening, it needs to be a two-way street. We need to let customers know. If they place an order with you for something, and you tell them it's gonna be a two week delivery and whatever happens, the factory gets backed up, there's a fire at the factory, a, a key employee is out, are you letting them know the item is gonna be a little later? Are you offering them a, sub a substitute? Or are you hoping that they don't realize that it's the two weeks and when they call, do you not answer the phone because you don't wanna face the fact that you don't have what you told them that they were going to have? Mistakes happen, things come up. You can own them, or you can rent them. 
let me introduce you to the renter. She's just there for a paycheck. She doesn't care if the customer is happy or not. She's not staying late. She's looking at her watch to see that it's 5 o'clock. And the most important thing that she's doing all day is checking Facebook. Can't have it. How many times have you gone to a grocery store and the cashier is looking at her cell phone or his cell phone? Have we, have we all experienced that? Where is the store manager? Check oh, he's checking <laughs> Facebook too. I don't, un I don't understand. I, it, it like seriously blows my mind. The kind of experiences that I have. Sometimes I think, is there like a sign on the back of me that says, treat me poorly? Is it? Somebody must have taken it off. I feel like I attract bad service. I could be a tougher critic than some of you. Do you think that's possible? You, can you tell that I'm a tough cookie, right? It's not fun going out to a restaurant with me because I'm doing a commentary. I'm doing a blow by blow on, a, oh my God, it took so long for her to bring the menus. Why, why did she come back? How come she threw the plate on the table? So imagine having your customer service antennas up all the time. Welcome to my world. The uh, level of expectation of service is mutual between the customer and the customer service representative. Whereas the fact that you are on the receiving end of a phone call, and you're asking what is the issue, problem, concern, and the person can't articulate the problem, it makes it much more challenging for that customer service to be derailed to manage the expectation, to solve the, the problem, find the solution, and let, let that customer uh, off the phone, you know, ha happy, a happy customer. You know, so like in everybody's business, we have a section of our, of our clientele who cannot articulate the problem without screaming, without using four letter words, and, and those are the type of clientele that you want to let off the phone nicely, but sometimes that solution isn't an option. Okay, I hear you. Does anybody else have customers that don't get it and don't know all the answers and are not as knowledgeable and able to articulate? Mm -hmm. sure. We should be polite no matter what. Well, we still should be polite no matter what. We shouldn't take things personal. We should realize that that person is somebody's grandmother, is somebody's sister, is somebody's <coughs> friend. And the people that seem the hardest to deal with are the ones that need our love and maybe they don't get it from anybody else and so if we could say a kind word and we can assure them you know what I hear you I'm here for you don't worry I'm not gonna let you off the phone until you understand until we're both on the same page we didn't write a word up here that probably needs to go up here and it's patience isn't that important and it, and it goes both ways. And you know, if I say I don't understand, and you just say the same thing to me two or three times, I'm probably still not gonna understand. You're gonna get mad that I'm not understanding, but if I didn't understand it the first time you said it, chances are it's not gonna sound differently the second or the third time. And so maybe that's time to ask a question of the person. Or maybe it's time to say, you know what, I must not be um, understanding you. Maybe, maybe it's me. You know what, let me, let me have you talk to Mike, and, and Mike should be able to help you. And transfer the call to somebody else. But give it a try first. You've got to ensure that the people that you have working for you have the right mindset. When we hire people, I need somebody who has seven years of what kind of industry? What's your industry? Coffee. I need somebody who has five years of experience in the coffee industry. You might get somebody that has five years experience in the coffee industry. However, that doesn't mean that they understand what customer service is. You know what? I could teach anybody, well I can't, you could teach anybody about coffee. But can you teach somebody how to be empathetic? Can you teach them how to listen? Can you teach them how to care? So don't worry about hiring somebody with experience. And by the way, if you're hiring for a customer service position, just because they have 10 years of customer service experience doesn't mean it's been 10 years as rave. It could have been 10 years as rant. So I'd rather take somebody who's got that ownership mindset. I'm excited, I'm interested, I'm personable. I got a cape. The next time somebody shows up for an interview and they pull a cape out of their you know, bag, 
Hire that person. Have questions with them, conversations about what would you do if a customer called and said, I want to cancel my contract with you. I don't want to do business with you anymore. And let them tell you. And are they, are they making eye contact with you? Are they fidgeting? Are they paying attention? Are they saying, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? What did you say? Because those are all signs of whether or not that person has the mindset that you want representing your brand. Remember I said earlier that Rant owns your brand or Rant is your brand? You know who really owns your brand? Customers. How do customers own your brand? Because they're the ones who are going to buy it. Because they're, they're going to brand talk about They're going to they're going to the ones you're going to talk about. They drive your business. They do. And so years ago, you owned your brand. You put out the advertising and the marketing and you told people, my Tide detergent did this and it was two times faster, right? I got to, I got to put the message out into the world about who our company was and what we did, our products, our services, our on time, all those, all those mission statements that I read before. But you don't own your brand anymore because social media, because of the way we communicate, because of transparency. So again, the stories that your customers are telling are based on the experiences that we are providing them. Okay. We're coming down into the home stretch. And by the way, turning rants into raves, I heard it was a pretty decent book. You know, it wasn't like a bestseller yet, but it could be if all of you read it and then go on Amazon and write a review. We're actually going to auc auction off. We're not auctioning off. We're going to raffle off a couple of these books. And there's a, um, a bowl in the back. If you haven't already put your business card in, please do, because I'd love you to take the book home so that you can share it with your staff and ensure that you have no rants in your office. Actually, Melissa, do you want to walk around with that bowl and get people's cards? I want to share with you the keys to great customer service, according to Randy Bussey, customer service expert, but more importantly, customer. OK? And by the way, I have one of these for everyone, so please come up and get one before you leave. Number one, think and act like an owner of the company. So you don't have to be the owner to be thinking and acting like an owner. Number two, connect with your customers. What do I mean when I say connect with your customers? What does that mean? How do we connect? What's a way that you connect with some of your customers? Get on the same level. Take, take an interest in them personally. Take an interest in them. Get on their level, right? You know, sales 101, if you go to a prospect's office, you, you know, you're supposed to scan the office to see, do they have any pictures of, you know, the Mets on their wall? And then if they do, oh, how about those Mets this year, right? Except maybe not, but, <laughs> right? Be interested in your customer. Some of us have customers that we speak with on a regular basis, and they say, oh, you know, I'm going on a cruise tomorrow. I can't wait to get out of here. You know, I'm going to miss the snow. Well, the next time you talk to them in a week or two, how many of you are saying, how was your cruise? Wow, you remembered? My, my, oh, I have my daughter's you know, high school graduation this weekend. How was the graduation? Stay interested and let it be genuine. If you're just saying it to say it, then, then not. And by the way, there's always something to connect with your customer about, even if you're not going to have a relationship with them, an ongoing relationship, right? Number three, have conversations not interrogations. You know what the difference is? Did you ever call a company up on the phone and they ask you questions like this? What's your name? What's your address? What's your phone number? What's your account number? Where were you on the night of the 17th? <laughs> That's an interrogation. And the only place that that should happen is in a police station. We want to have a conversation. You know, I used to live in Amityville. And when I would call companies that were out of state, you know, I was buying something or ordering something, and I would give my address, some of them would say, oh, Amityville, is that near the Amityville Horror House? And I can't tell you how many times I got asked that question. That is a way to connect. 
Now, does that mean that you should have a 10 minute conversation with me about the Amityville Horror House? No, but if you talk to me for 10 seconds or 20 seconds about the Amityville Horror House, it makes me realize one thing. What's the one thing it makes me realize? They're interested, they're listening, and they are a human being. Speaking of human beings, how many of you are this kind of company, B2B? I'm a, I'm a B2B, I'm a business selling to businesses, right? How many of you are B2C? A business selling to consumers? You're both? Okay. Is there anybody that's not any of these? Okay. So imagine that model doesn't work anymore. New model. Starting today. Human to human, what a concept. Because even though you're a business, you're a human being. The people of the business are human beings. And even though you're selling to a business, the person that is buying from you is a human being. And same thing here. If we thought about our business like this, would it possibly change the way we interact with others? Just a thought, I don't know. Take it or leave it, you don't have to, it's okay. All right, number four, personalize your customer's experience. That kind of goes hand in hand with the connecting, right? And it's about using the customer's name throughout the conversation. Dale Carnegie said, there's nothing sweeter than the sound of thine own name. Don't call me ma'am. Use my name and look at me and I wanna marry you, right? I feel like I'm the only person in the room. Dale Carnegie said, there's nothing sweeter than the sound of thine own name. Don't call me ma'am. Use my name and look at me, and I want to marry you. Right? I feel like I'm the only person in the room. Number five, make it easy for the customer, which means put your phone number on your website, which means open up more cash registers when you see that there's a line which means don't have a recording on the phone that says your call is very important to us, your approximate wait time is 47 minutes. Because you're talking out of both sides of your mouth, that's not making it easy for me, right? Went to the doctor not too long ago, had to wait an hour in the waiting room. That's not making it easy for me. I know, you know, emergencies come up, but you know what? You knew the doctor was running behind four hours ago. How about you call me and say, you know what, the doctor's running a little late, it's going to be closer to 1.30, or if you want, we can reschedule. But let me decide. Don't hold me prisoner. Make it easy for me. How many times have you called up customer service and said, oh, you know, I, I need to change my address on my account? And they say, oh, you have to go online for that. I'm talking to customer service right now. Why can't you? Oh, we can't do that here. That's not making it easy. And if we don't make it easy for our customers, guess what they're going to do? Go somewhere else. Number six, treat a complaint like a gift. We talked about that before. Number seven, give your customer more than just the price. Hi, I'm calling because I want to find out um, you know, how much your oil is. I do a lot of work with oil companies. Hi, can you tell me how much your oil is? Oh yeah, it's uh, $2.99 a gallon. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Click. Now. What oil company owner would have that conversation with a prospective customer? Any? None. None. Because when I say, hi, I'm calling to, I want to find out about the price of oil. Sure, I'll be happy to help you with that. Who am I speaking with? Oh, this is, you know, Randy Bussey. Oh, okay, Miss Bussey. Uh, do you currently have oil now? No, as a matter of fact, I'm just moving into the neighborhood and, you know, I'm looking for a new company. Well, great. Welcome to the neighborhood. Are you looking for a full service or, you know, COD? And now I'm having a conversation. And I didn't give you the price, because as soon as you give the price, if your price is higher than your competitor, you're done. Price comes last. And sometimes, if you're really good, the price never comes up, because the price is so irrelevant, because I heard you. 
and I connected with you, and I had my cape on, and I made it all about you, and I was present and connecting with you, price becomes irrelevant. And by the way, as a customer yourself, how many of you are willing to pay more for a really good experience? Everyone. Everyone. So if that alone is not reason to provide a great experience to your customers because you could charge more, I don't know what else there is. Number eight, differentiate your company with outstanding service. Don't just be like the other companies that do what you do. You got to get better than them. Make a test call into your company. Test call into your competitors to see what they're doing. And then go one up. Don't go one lower in their price, right? What happens if we are selling on price? Somebody has a lower price, what happens? I'm done. I'm done. Number nine, don't just satisfy your customers. We talked about that before, satisfaction. Who wants to satisfy their customers? OK, yeah, I went. Yeah, they did what they said they were going to do. I was satisfied. Oh, look, a new company does that. I'm going to go check them out. If I'm satisfied, I'm not loyal. I want loyal customers. Loyal customers are going to go out of their way to do business with you. They're going to tell their friends. They're going to, willing to pay more. They'll drive a little further. So satisfied customers is not enough. That means that it was OK. Wasn't great. Wasn't horrible. It was just OK. I'm satisfied. Shoot for loyal. Number 10, be a rave, not a rant. I'll leave you with this. If you don't take care of your customers, someone else will. Thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, 